everything that I decided to do because I stopped eating meat in prison 22 years ago. Yeah. My whole life would started ascending because I felt like the universe had my back and it just kept protecting me and kept opening one door after another for me. I'm Rip Esselstyn and welcome to the Plan Strong podcast. The mission at Plan Strong is to further the advancement of all things within the plant-based movement. We advocate for the scientifically proven benefits of plant-based living and envision a world that universally understands, promotes, and prescribes plants as a solution to empowering your health, enhancing your performance, restoring the environment, and becoming better guardians to the animals we share this planet with. We welcome you wherever you are on your Plan Strong journey, and I hope that you enjoy the show. One of the best things about hosting the Plan Strong podcast is getting the opportunity to meet people that I otherwise would never have the opportunity to connect with and not only connect with them, but really connect with them on a very, very deep and, uh, and very personal level. And today I'm honored to introduce you to a fellow kale crunching soul, Dom Thompson. Imagine Growing up poor in Chicago's West Side, witnessing your first murder at age five, and having this mindset that you're willing to do whatever it takes to protect yourself and to provide for your family, going to prison at age 21, all while still excelling in school, athletics, and work. And it is a background that is so vastly different from the one how I was raised, but it is a super important story to tell because to understand Dom Thompson today, you simply have to look back on his past. And I want you to know that Dom is a beautiful, humble soul who defies every stereotype that we have of what it means to be a, quote, tough guy. He's an activist, bodybuilder, endurance athlete, dog dad, and a social entrepreneur known for his businesses, eatwhatelephantseat.com and crazysandweirdos.com. What's even more fascinating to learn about Dom is that he went plant strong his first week in prison, which is absolutely unbelievable, because he had this spiritual epiphany, awakening, and the decision to stop eating any meat completely was able to transform his life. His mantra, if it requires harm, then nah. Today, he gives us a riveting look at his past and discusses that spiritual shift that informed his present day work as an activist and social entrepreneur. When you eradicate harm from your life, the universe has your back, Dom likes to say. And I couldn't agree more because I too have witnessed that in my own life. And before we launch into our deep discussion, I'm thrilled to announce that Dom has joined Team Plan Strong and will be heading to Austin for February 19th to run the 5K in person with over 150 other Team Plan Strong brothers and sisters. And just so you're all aware, it's not too late. For you to join this growing movement of athletes from around the world who are also fueled by plants. All right, today is a big, wonderful conversation with the beautiful Dominique Thompson. Dom, this is this is a real thrill to have you on the Plant Strong podcast. I've heard so much about you for a long time, and I'm glad that we were uh, able to make this happen. So thank you for making time for me today. No, thank you for having me, man. I heard a lot of great things about you too. And obviously we have a lot of mutual friends and mutual passions for this plant-based and vegan community that we both are uh, involved in. So yeah, thanks for having me on the show. Definitely. Sure. definitely. You, uh, yeah, you're definitely uh, a kale brother. And in fact, absolutely, we, without even like <laughs> planning ahead of time, for those of you that aren't watching on YouTube, 
you know, I'm wearing my blue kale shirt yep. and Dom is wearing his, what is that? Purple is a burgundy. Yeah. Burgundy. burgundy yeah. Burgundy it's kale shirt. Burgundy I, I, kale. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel so com comfortable in it. Like, you know, it, it's a, it's a good statement. You know, it gets people to have a, com have a conversation about it. I mean, usually I'm in the gym with, with a kale shirt on or a kale sweater on or, or one of my own, the eat we uh, eat well, elephants eat uh shirts on and it, it's a great conversation starter for guys seeing me especially when i'm looking like a, a lot of heavy iron on a lot of plates and they just yeah. like are you vegan and i'm like yeah <laughs> uh, well and of course you know your kale is bigger than my kale today <laughs> <laughs> in fairness i did do chess this morning you know, monday is international chess day for me so <laughs> yeah. well i uh i saw you ripping it up for those of you that don't know Dom's got a really spectacular Instagram channel. Uh, very enlightening, very entertaining. Highly recommend it. But I was w watching some of your stuff, and on chess day, you get after it, after it. I mean, yeah. le level, down, up, you name it, man. You're hitting every angle. <laughs> yeah, it's important to hit um, a combination to shock the body, the pictorials, and and more. I think a lot of guys and, and people in general, men and women that get in the gym sometimes for hit it, forget to hit different muscle groups and different angles to help the growth. Um, and I I've been lifting weights since I've been in fifth grade, man. I had my first Joe Weeder bench uh, when I was in fifth grade, and going into football junior, junior football, my first year was in fifth grade. So I've been in the iron gain for uh man over 25 years it feels like yeah no nice. it's been a while yeah it's been a while um dom i i can't wait to unpack your 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 story which is it is so uh it's so inspiring and you know to me you're like on the when you know your background, you seem like the last person that would ever be, you know, vegan and be an activist and plant based and be such a big hearted, compassionate, you know, wonderful human being. But yeah. you are right. And I, I yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so you're kind of you're self described as all these different things. And I, I want to ask you about it and then we'll we'll talk about each one. Sure. Yeah. So, so one of the yeah. first things that you say is you're a son. Yeah. And I, I'd love to know what that means to you. Yeah. Uh, I come from a, a single parent home. Uh, my mother raised three of us. I'm my mother's only boy. I'm the youngest. Uh, I have two older sisters. And <clears throat> what that means to me, because she worked multiple jobs as a nurse, uh, trying to keep food on the table and trying to keep a roof over our heads. We stayed in a uh, originally a one bedroom apartment on the west side of Chicago. Uh, I come from humble beginnings um, and being in this violent, excuse me, very tough neighborhood. Like I seen my first murder at the age of five and for my mother to do all she could to kind of protect me and my sisters from what was happening in our community, in our neighborhood. Uh, she did her best. And, you know, uh, and I'm a son to me means the fact that I can appreciate all the things she has done as a parent to do the best she she could do with the hands she was dealt with, uh, whether she had to work two jobs and even sometimes working three jobs. She would work nursing homes in the evenings, third shift, and even on the weekends to the point that me and my sisters wouldn't see her. And that's how I learned to cook, actually, because uh, I had to do a lot of defending for myself and cook a lot for myself. It's mm. kind of hard, kind of hard having teenage sisters <laughs> to depend on. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, growing a young boy, uh, but yeah, my mom was and still is the rock of our family. She's an amazing woman. She's the most uh, selfless human being I ever met. She would literally give her all her all her last to a stranger on the street. Mm that needs it her her last piece of food it'll go it'll be nice where she didn't go eat she didn't eat so we can eat um that's how bad things was in the beginning so yeah i'm, I'm a i'm a son proud son of an amazing amazing strong black woman what's her what's her name maria that's her name maria yeah maria yeah um 
And so you say you grew up with, was it, was it two other brothers or two sisters? Two sisters. Yeah. I grew up with two older sisters, uh, my sisters, uh, Tanya and Yolanda. Uh-huh. And are you, uh, are you close with them? I am. Uh, I mean, we, we're not like, you know, like, I don't talk to them every day, but if something happens or they need me and, and I need them, they'll be there for sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, without a doubt. We, me and the middle, me and the oldest have a lot in common, but me and the middle uh, used to bump heads, just like the middle bump heads with the oldest. It's funny because me and the oldest are a lot like our mom, no wow. nonsense, straight shooters, uh, very independent, um, just different. And the middle one is <laughs> sometimes act like she has the middle child syndrome. <laughs> yeah, but I love her to death. Um, and she has my amazing nieces and nephews. She uh, have three nephews and two nieces from her. And she had enough uh, kids in the family for yeah. uh, me and the oldest. Me and the oldest, we don't have any human kids. Yep. Um, so the, we helped raise the middle, uh, the troop, the, the team uh, for my sisters. So, yeah, the, they're amazing women, too. They've been through their own experiences. I always talk about, laugh about it. You know, it's funny. I was, before I signed my, my book deal, um, I was talking with my publisher. It's amazing how many incredible stories because they was really fascinated by my story. But, you know, you get jaded to that stuff. It's normal to someone like me. I know a lot of people that have been through similar experiences like I have or been through worse. But there's some stories in my family where those women from my sisters to my cousins can make some incredible books based mm -hmm. on their own life experiences, too. So. Um, looking forward to more of those stories coming out in the future too, because I want to help them. I want to be the catalyst that kind of help them get their stories out there too. Cause I think it can inspire a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Well, tell me this. So you just mentioned that you uh, you signed a book deal, and mm -hmm. so, um, what's the time? What's the timeline on that? Yeah, actually, next month we're turning in the master manuscript. It's my first cookbook. It's a hybrid, a mix of my origin stories mixed with. Uh, over 60 recipes that uh, a lot of those recipes I grew up loving, where it be my mom's famous enchiladas, veganized that, mm -hmm. to my grandmother's gumbo, we veganized that. And I'm um, really, really proud and really excited about this book because it's really like the first of its kind. Uh, we signed this deal this time last year and it was such a good proposal that they had a bidding war oh nice uh, between the big four of the big publishers and we went with uh, well i went with what i felt was the best home uh because the publisher made it clear to me and they had a whole team on a zoom call and i appreciate that every one of those team members it was about at least seven people on that call from pr to uh, different editors and, and more marketing um, but each one of them, I can tell, read that story. They all had tears in their eyes, and that moved me. I didn't feel like I was just a business mm -hmm. transaction. And they said that they're in the business to buy authors, not books, and that kind of struck a chord. Uh, so I'm really happy with the home that I've landed on with, with my publishing company. And the master manuscript is being turned in actually next month. The principal photography is starting around March. And yeah. so I want to say we should get it out there by third quarter of next year. Congratulations. That's a, Thank you. that's a huge hurdle to, to overcome turning that in. Uh, can you tell us what uh, publishing house you went with? Absolutely. Uh, Simon and Schuster. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Yeah. With Simon and Schuster. Great team. Uh, the name of the book uh, right now is eat what elephants eat at the yeah. food company. Uh, it's an incredible book uh, with a lot of inspiring recipes and more had a great team with me working on this. My my co-writer, she's amazing. I can't wait to <clears throat> for the world to really see this because I'm I'm feeling really good about it. I think it's going to go on to be a New York Times bestseller. So I'm really happy about that. Oh, I'm I'm confident it will. That's exciting. <laughs> yeah. So Dom, yeah, huge congrats on the book deal. Uh, you know, having having done a couple myself, uh, especially getting that that first one under your belt, it is uh, it is it's fantastic and. You know, not not many people have the the good fortune of getting an advance and let alone having a bidding war over the story because they know it is packed with so much fantastic, you know, information. So huge kudos to you. 
Yeah, it's very humbling, uh, to be honest with you, to have <clears throat> that opportunity. Um, here I'm a kid from Chicago. Um, never in a million years thought I'll yeah. be writing a book. Um, and it's nothing I aspire to do. Nothing that I do that people will learn of me through this podcast or people already uh, are aware of me was something I aspire to do as far as entrepreneurship, activism, everything kind of organically happened as we get through this podcast and you'll learn, which is a beautiful thing when things organically happens. And so I'm very fortunate, very humble, very blessed to have this opportunity to just present uh, my story in a different format. And that's going to be an incredible book that I hope you all uh, take a look at when it comes out next year. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, all right. So there's a lot of different places I want to go, but I think the place I want to go first is you're vegan and you are, you, from everything that I can see, you <laughs> love being, being vegan and it speaks to you. Yeah. Uh, and it, and, and it's almost like this, this is, was kind of part of your DNA long before you kind of knew it was. It was, um, I loved animals since I was a kid. It was always in me. I, I was that kid growing up in Chicago that would, uh, break up dog fights and more. Um, and you know, young kids and boys being boys were like to experiment with different things or they're growing up and I would have friends around me that would shoot all types or throw rocks at squirrels, stray cats and stray dogs and do these very harmful things to these animals. And I was always in the middle, uh, breaking it up or slapping them on the back of the head, telling them that's not cool. Like I have always had a, a strong heart and compassion for basically the vulnerable, you know, um, humans or uh, non-humans, even if it was a, a guy or a kid being picked on, I just felt like anyone being picked on, anyone in a vulnerable situation where they can't defend themselves, n the natural energy in me wants to respond to that to protect them. So as long as I can remember, I have always been a protector for sure. Yeah. yeah. And so when did, um, when did you first have that inkling that, you know what, I don't have really any interest in, in eating animals. Just something about this doesn't feel right. Yeah. Um, the infamous story of when I was eight <laughs> years old. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, my mom, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, she did all she could to provide for us and um, buy what she could and, and to put what she deemed and most people in the 80s and from that uh, older generation deemed as food. Um, and I have always been a picky eater, um, always been a really picky eater. And I never ch chicken wings and pork chops was probably the two most uh, uh, meat based type of servings that was placed in my home, um, the most affordable. Mm -hmm. Um, besides us eating a lot of carbs with, <laughs> or sandwiches just to make do, uh, cause like I said, we, we come from very humble beginnings, uh, my, my family. Um, but I was always a picky eater and up until that point, it was just this moment in time. Um, I was eight years old and my mom was serving us chicken wings um, and I was looking at those chicken wings and I looked at her, looked at my arm. I, I just was going through a, like a light bulb moment. And those wings to me look like little bitty arms. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just digging through the, cause anyone that has had a chance to eat chicken wings, you can see all the tendons. You can see the anatomy of the, the wing itself. Um, and I will always pick around it. Um, and, and dig around that and just eat what I can, like detach the, the flesh, the muscle, um, and try to go for the whitest part of the muscle because the darkest flesh to me just looks slimy and it looked unhealthy and it just looked gross. Uh, it was something that I just didn't want anything to do with. Uh, so I was always picking at those wings, but in this moment, I'm looking at those wings and looking at her and looking at my arms and I just pushed 
back the plate and say, I, I don't want this anymore. She's like, what do you mean? I was like, they look like little bitty arms and I don't want to eat this. And, you know, it's kind of hard to tell a, uh, a very strong, um, mm -hmm. independent black woman um, <laughs> that's no nonsense from the civil rights era uh, that you're not finna eat her food. Uh, uh, but she, I'm a chip off the old block and my mom have always uh, taught me to speak my mind even to her. Mm -hmm. And so she was like, you're not going to eat then. And I was like, well, then I'm not going to eat. Um, and we kind of had bumped heads in that moment. Uh, but she, you know, to her fairness, you know, you got to, this is not the the 2000s. This is not 2022 where mm. your child says, I don't want to eat meat. And you're like, oh, okay, well, maybe he'll like this plant-based option. You know, you got this young growing boy <laughs> in your kitchen um, and you can go out to the, the, the grocery stores to buy all these amazing different plant-based options or, you know, even look online for alternatives. Uh, but here we are in the 80s. And what do you do in that moment? Uh, so my mom went out to the grocery store. And she came back with uh, uh, fish sticks. <laughs> yeah. uh, she figured that it was an aesthetic thing for me. Mask the, the, the masking of the what exactly I was eating it was uh, bundled up in similar to chicken nuggets, uh, where as long as I don't see where it's coming from, yeah, uh, I can view it as being edible. Uh, and I went on to eat a lot of fish sticks and a lot of chicken nuggets and stuff like that. So she was kind of smart by doing that. Uh, and that was that moment where I kind of my first experience with realizing I don't want to have anything to do with meat. The problem with that is I didn't go down the rabbit hole as much as I should. And granted, I was eight years old, but still, um, I still could, I, I should have continued to explore that uh, because that memory <clears throat> is the same memory that would later on at the age of 21, 22, come back into my psyche, into my thoughts when I was on my knees praying in my jail cell, when I was serving time to so trying to figure out what was I doing in prison besides the crime that I uh, took responsibility for, uh, but trying to figure out it was their deeper meeting and everything came back into my mind in that moment in time when I was praying to that little boy that was eight year old and that's when I realized that you could be an eight-year-old Dominic or an 80-year-old Dominic or an eight-year-old Rip or an 80-year-old Rip. And if you don't follow through what karma shows you, it's going to come back to kind of repay you in some capacity. It could be through um, disease. It could be through economic hardships. It could be through a loss uh, in your life, a health issue and pain and suffering. And that was my moment where I realized that um karma came back full circle and then wanted to remove me from society when i was serving time and that's when i truly made the full circle connection when i was 21 22 sitting in my jail cell and had that aha moment that created this mantra organically came in my mind that if it requires harm then all and i don't want to have anything else to do with it and that was 22 years ago where i haven't had meat in 22 years and I never look back. So, wow. yeah. So, yeah. if it requires harm, then nah. That's, yeah. Then nah. Then, then nah. Nah. Yeah. N -A -N -A -H, nah. Yeah. Nah. N A H H. Nah. Okay. Uh, or if you're in the South, N A H. Or if you're in the North, N A N O. No. 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 <laughs> Just absolutely no, nothing. And that mantra has stuck with me to this day. And it's the very foundation of who I am as a human mm. and the foundation mm. of my integrity. Mm. Love it. Tell me this. Because I want to know, and it, it sounds like your mom was your, your rock, just absolutely incredible. How did you get from being that eight-year-old that basically said, you know, you know I, I don't want these chicken wings, to being, um, I, I guess you call it a criminal, and then getting put in jail? I would think yeah. that your, your mom, somewhere along the line, would have put her foot down and done everything she could to say, Dom, you're going down a bad path and I, we got to stop this. 
Yeah, I mean, again, um, <laughs> being in the environment that I was involved in, um, there was definitely different influences that I just couldn't escape. There's a time yeah. um, that a, a lot of young black men, especially in the 80s when crack, uh, crack was introduced to our communities, uh, um, sadly through our government, but that's another story. Uh, there's a time where a lot of us hit a fork in the road. Um, and I, I certainly hit a fork in the road where uh, sometimes you have to throw and go through, as Jay-Z once put it, men have to do men things for men's salary. And I had to hit these bumps regardless. I, I Regardless of the car, type of car I was driving in or the type of road I was in, uh, some potholes were simply unavoidable. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll get over that pothole, but we have to experience that pothole. We have to experience that flat tire. We had to pull on the side of the road and change that tire to continue to go on to that row of peace and that role of compassion, what people know me as today. Um, yeah, I'm not innocent. I went through some things and I experienced some challenges, um, but sometimes you had to to become a better person without struggle, like Frederick Douglass used to say, it can be no progress. And that was my that was my timeline, um, needing to go through what I needed to go through. And sure, my mother was this very strong woman, but it's only so much she can do sure. to protect her kids from the streets or the streets, uh, protecting the streets from her kids in some capacities, if that makes sense. Uh, and uh, my experiences and who I was is not a reflection of who my mother was mm -hmm. as a parent, as a woman. Um, those are two different experiences. Um, and we just live in a society and certainly back then where certain things was just biased and, and, and challenging for us to get out of. Um, and I had to go through that, um, and I have no regrets because it made me a better person mm -hmm. for sure. Um, I don't take that away. And I took full responsibility. I'm not playing the victim. I'm not saying that it's someone else's fault. Um, but I did what I had to do um, and and served uh, time for it, for sure. Yeah. What can you tell me? So in high school. Yeah. Would you, would you say you were in the you were on the football team? Oh. Yeah, yeah, I was a really great football player. Yeah. Okay. What what position did you play? Middle linebacker. Oh man. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. that's that's a good. I already know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's who I went um, through and through, head to toe, energy wise. Yeah, I was uh, uh, that H back, uh, what we call the husky back. Uh, yeah. Our, our mouse mascots was huskies, and uh, yeah, I was an H back in the middle. Started out at the outside linebacker. Did an incredible job there. Yeah. Used to destroy some of those guards, try to pull on me and block on me. And um, <laughs> but I, I excel so much as outside linebacker. Um, and granted, I was a little bit small to be as far as height. Um, I'm mm -hmm. about six feet. Um, and but those boys, you know, I played for uh, class six A high school. It was pretty big high school, and we played in the big league. Um, but it was some big boys on that line. <laughs> Some huge big boys um, talking about 300 pounds, uh, 200 to 300 pounds in high school, which is insane. Yeah. Um, but I still bang with them in my up into my junior year is when my coach was like, we need to put you in middle linebacker. You're too fast. You're strong. Hmm. And we, you know, I, I had my fellow linebacker team. Because that's when people was experiencing too with uh, – ends uh, defensive ends converting over to outside linebacker um, it's more so uh, my body build tight speed and intellect fit perfectly in in the defensive system as middle linebacker yeah and so uh, correct help me out here because i'm seeing you as this incredible football player yeah. probably probably had a leadership role yeah i did and so and so where where does where do you kind of get mixed up in in gangs and I guess drugs and stuff like that? Yeah, uh, it, that culture doesn't mesh with the other one, and I'm but I'm ignorant, right? Yeah, yeah this is Chicago, not Texas. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's different, man. Football player. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I I play football, but we have 
off season. And we also have the pressures of growing up in a society where, you know, families need money. People need money for, for the littlest things. And yeah, football was something that I, absolutely love doing just like i did advanced architecture i I did advanced architecture in high school where i was killing it uh i always had a creative mind um um, so but it doesn't mean what i did outside of that high school again you have two different separations and two you still had to come home to an environment still had the pressure to Mm. succeed and provide um in many ways so that um, my first experiences with streets you know i was uh, I wouldn't say groom, but my older cousins, uh, Booby, uh, Walt, Matt, uh, especially Booby, some of the most legendary dudes in the streets, uh, some of the most original, some of the original architectures to some of these gangs in Chicago. And I was experiencing some of these things from as young as four years old, mm. what they was going through. So I had these different outside influences. Uh, and coming back to these environments and I had to do um, what I had to do, which is I, ch- I, I, I try to do both, uh, try to exceed mm. on this side. And uh, like, that's the fork in the road. I told you about, you have the good side over here, try to stay, you know, narrow and straight. And you had to side over here. Like, let me try to cut some corners. Cause we need money. I need money. We need to do this. I need to, grow up fast um it's, you know it's not like i had financial help from a father you know i had an absent father mm-hmm. um in my life and so yeah i did a pretty good job anything that i anyone that knows me i do <laughs> once i pick up something uh, i excelled in it i just like i excelled in school math english i graduated early in high school um, a couple of semesters early um excelled in football until i broke my ankle severely um and back then orthopedic medicine it wasn't as advanced as it was today. Today, if you break your ankle in high school, mm. they'll open you up right away, operate on you, and say so you'll be okay in about eight months to a year. Back then, this is the 90s, uh, they're putting a cast on you and saying you're not going to be fully 100% until eight years from now. Uh, the bones have to heal on their own. Uh, so orthopedic medicine wasn't advanced as then. In, in my football career, when I broke my ankle my uh, senior year, mm. all those – potential scholarships, everything. I had a lot of schools that wanted me to play for them. Mm-hmm. Even had the uh, the Bears wrote a letter to uh, to me uh, trying to encourage me to, you know, go back and to play in college. Don't 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 be discouraged because they they learned of me and know that I was a good player and stuff like that. But my ankle was just never the same. It took yeah, it took about six years for it to be a hundred percent solid again. Yeah. Uh, my ankle for sure. Not a good injury. I actually broke my right ankle uh, two years ago, mountain biking. And, okay. But okay. unlike you, I was able to, you know, I have the, had the surgery, had some pins, plates, all that stuff. And, um, and I'm, it's been two years and I'm finally now about okay. Right. Yeah. I'm not a hundred percent, but yeah. Yeah. I would have pins put in me if they, again, the medicine just wasn't advanced. And it was, especially for teenagers. I, I think a lot of the medical providers in the scientific community didn't want to really operate on kids yeah. back in those days because, you know, it's still, they're going through that growth spurt and they don't want to have anything to interfere with them as young adults. So I had to sit it out and, and it, it was, it was, it was troubling. Cause I, you know, like anybody that played football, especially that was good at it. Mm. I, I felt like I would have been really good in the NFL without a doubt. Yeah. Uh, but that's when most other areas that, I was driving on that, again, just grabbing a fork in a row. I started excelling in those areas specifically, yeah. And so so did you go to college or, or no? Yeah, I did. Um, that's when I got indicted. I was <laughs> kind of – I was out of the dope game. Uh, I was done doing what I did. Like my experience in the street life and everything I did in the streets was really in my teenage years, and, and, and here I am um, – Going to college, have my first entry level position in healthcare. Uh, wow! And again, this these are two different timelines. So, I'm not sure the demographics of people that listen to your podcast, but to be a college student back then, and, and again, this wasn't just me. I knew a lot of people that was doing this. Mm-hmm. Uh, you go to you go to college for twelve to sixteen hours full time, and I knew people working forty hours a week, including me. So, 
my first job was 15, even though I was in the streets. Again, I was smart about what I was doing and I always wanted to be better than what I was doing. I was trying to get away from that lifestyle. And I, and I thought I did successfully until I ended up getting indicted when I was, when I was in the college, I got indicted uh, for uh, some of that, those old crimes and uh, got set up by um, a couple of informants. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was really challenging to, here I am, never had a speeding ticket in my life. <clears throat> never had a, been arrested for anything. Trying to do the right thing. The, not even part of the streets. Like, they was trying to paint me a picture out to be. Um, and here I am in college and working a full-time job, um, doing everything to bust my ass to be a productive person and, and a citizen to society. And I had to uh, look at these papers that not said the people of the state of Georgia, not people of the county of Fulton, but the people of the United States of America versus you. That's pretty scary. You feel like a terrorist. Your, mm-hmm. your government is indicting you. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, it's one of the most... Um, I tell people all the time, it's the most scariest piece of paper you can get uh, placed in front of you. Um, I was in custody, but anytime you see the United States of America versus you, you, you know, you're in a, you're in a bad situation, really bad situation right there. Um, so I had to process all of that and I end up hiring a really great attorney, uh, that, we both felt like this was an entrapment case too. Um, and I, we wanted to go to trial, but like he told me, and this is the first solid advice that I got from anyone. Cause I never had a mentor growing up, anything like that. Uh, but he was a solid dude. Um, he was a brother too. Um, and he was like, listen, <clears throat> if we go to trial and you lose, uh, you're not coming home to your thirties. You know, you're only 21, 22, you're a young man, uh, and you're not coming home until you're in your 30s. And that's kind of hard to process. He said, you and I both know that mm-hmm. you're not completely innocent. Um, and this is what's called karma. That's the first time I ever heard the word karma. You know, he, 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 you know, he had a heart to heart with me about it. He's like, uh, the things you have done in the past, whether you think they were innocent or they could have been severe. Uh, regardless, we arrived at this point where you have to face some consequences. Uh, now, we can go to trial, but I'm just letting you know if we lose, uh, the government feels like you're wasting their time instead of taking full responsibility. Uh, and they're going to throw a minimum of 10 years at you uh, mm. as a first time offender. And that's kind of hard to process. And that's when I was I was doing a lot in my life and I grew up fast um, in my teenage years. There was so many things I was doing at the age of 15 that I can write a whole book on <laughs> that even young men to older men to this day have an experience that I have experienced. Uh, but in that moment, I feel like I put on about 30 years mm. of, of my life um, because who wants to go do 87% of a sentence if because that's what you're in, in, in the feds you're doing 80 percent of 85 to 87 percent of your time um, and that's kind of hard to process for someone that's a, a young man uh, but he was right and that's when i took full responsibility uh, i didn't tell on nobody i didn't roll on nobody i took full responsibility for my crimes and pleaded for possession uh, with the intent to distribute and um we did what's called a blind plea uh, and we went in there and the government tried to recommend higher sentences and they felt like I wasn't cooperating. Uh, but we cooperated by me taking responsibility mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. Uh, and the judge ended up basically, uh, cause he had some guidelines and so, only so much he could have done uh, sentencing guidelines, which, are biased towards when you look at the historic sentencing guidelines or the federal um, sentencing guidelines related to drug and uh, cocaine specifically uh, a lot of those guidelines are biased towards 
uh, young black men coming from marginalized communities. Um, and I was in that scenario and he basically gave me a 10 year sentence, <clears throat> um, which was, they wanted me to do five years of hard time and five years of house arrest. So I did um, my time, um, I did about, I did a few years on, on a hard time and I got a couple years off of my sentence for the drug program that I attended. Uh, that gave me a lot of time off my um, my hard sentence because it's like a resident program. You you go serve your regular time, and then they shipped me to Florence, Colorado, for me to be in the RDAP program. That gave me up to like thirty six months off my time. I can't remember so long ago. Mm -hmm. um, and then I came home and did two years of house arrest. I was a role model citizen. Uh, got back on my feet. Uh, basically, spent my whole twenties dealing with the judicial system, trying to get back on my feet. And we went back in front of the judge. And even though I was on curfew and house arrest, they would allow me to work. And I showed and excelled um, in corporate America. I was able to get that first entry level position that I had received in healthcare when I was in college. Um, the health system, McNeil Hospital, took a second chance on me. Uh, they was very supportive of me when I came home. And they allowed me to have that entry level account representative position back. And I took that took that for granted. Here I am a felon able to get a, a job in mm -hmm. a health system uh, because they believed in me. Uh, and I excelled, really, really excelled. And I was able to get three years off my house arrest sentence. So um, I finally got a chance to breathe where I didn't have any responsibilities, uh, pay my my fees and my fines and restitution um, and served my time and really excelled in healthcare to the point that I uh, went to the sister company, Chicago Health System, and started negotiating the contracts for the hospital, for the IPA and the physicians, uh, two different medical groups that I managed on the north side of the hospital and the west side of Chicago, mm -hmm. and even excelled in that to the point that a company called Multiplan recruited me in the south and they wanted me to run the south region parts of the market in the South Forest business development and managed care contracting. So my church trajectory kind of mm -hmm. went, continued to excel uh, because this is one thing that <clears throat> a lot of people don't talk about when it comes to um, going through the same experience that I went through, or even vegans talk about when they remove themselves from oppressive systems and supporting industries that are doing just harm to other living beings and ecosystems. They don't talk about the spiritual side. And to me, everything that I decided to do, cause I stopped eating meat in prison 22 years ago, yeah. my whole life would started ascending cause I felt like the universe had my back and it just kept protecting me and kept opening one door after another for me all uh, because I truly was dialed in into this new lifestyle of doing no harm without, if it, if it requires any harm, not doing any part of that or being a part of it consciously knowing. And it ha has my back up until this day. And I just feel like a lot of people don't talk about some of the good things as far as benefits of your life, whether you're talking in your working professional life or in your family life or your spiritual life. A lot of people that remove meat and remove themselves from just harming things just simply don't talk about the other side of that coin of what it does to your mental health and then what it does to you as a human being. And everything has just been on the up and up from that from that point on. Yeah. Good karma. Yeah. Good uh, karma. Yeah. You you say in one of your, your Instagram posts that if you had one superpower, it would be to protect every last uh, animal in the world. Yeah, and I mean that. I do. Uh, every last animal and every last human that's vulnerable and can't defend for themselves, for sure. Because mm -hmm. we do live in a a this thing called life where there are some humans and non-human animals and, and very vulnerable uh, creations and, and communities that simply can use the help um, and either won't get the help or will continue to experience these these challenges that 
there's just no way for, to get away from it, you know. And people will always say, well, you know, you manifest what you you are, what you are, and you can live the American dream. You can be anything you want to be. Look at you. You came through. Not everyone, simply put, is not going to make it. Mm-hmm. It's only so much. It's, it's all, you, If you look at it logically, like math, right, you know, if all 300 million plus Americans want to be the president of the United States, that's not going to happen. <laughs> There's only one position for that. Mm-hmm. Same thing when it comes to the executive branch and the uh, Congress and House. There's only so many positions in so many different communities and industries. Um, and and we just set up on in a system that's driven by capitalism and, and other bias laws, too, that just set up to delay or even discourage people from achieving things or being the best that they can be. Mm -hmm. Um, And we just need to think about that. We just need more kindness in the world and more people to be more empathetic to not everyone is, is dealt a good hand and be more kind to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, If you, if you don't mind and and just tell me to, you know, uh, rip, I don't want to talk about that. Um, you know, grow, growing up in a very privileged household, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I have no idea what street street life is is about is like. Um, can you shed any light on that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Look, I'm open book. That's one thing everybody knows about me. I, you can ask me anything you want to ask me uh, from my personal upbringing to my love life. You can ask me anything you want to ask me. <laughs> uh, yeah, again, the, the growing up in the streets in the 80s and the 90s is a lot different than it is today. Um, uh, I think, and me observing uh, living in this day and age, I do know there's a lot of still challenges and a lot of systems and from, from unfair housing to... Um, limited funding to public schools in certain marginalized communities and, and more. I do feel like there's better opportunities um, today, definitely than it was historically, because we have this powerful tool called the internet, mm-hmm. you know, where almost everyone has access to it, no matter their economic background, almost everyone. And, and, So you have this wealth of information that you can become a self-starter to and do things and learn things, even if you're not getting it through parenting, through mentorship, through your school, your teachers. As long as you have that ambition and that passion. So if you want to be the best chef or learn how to be a chef or learn what schools offer the best engineering and architecture and how you can get started, all you need is a phone or a computer and access to the Internet. And you, you can start to go down that path or at least explore it. Mm. You know what I mean? Compared to me growing up without the internet, we, we didn't, that's a different timeline. We don't, we didn't have that wealth of information. Uh, we didn't have those different opportunities. So growing up in the streets <clears throat> or being part of the streets was a lot different. Um, I was in a gang called the Four Corner Hustlers, 4CH. Uh, that was the gang that was involved in. And um, they was part of the original fraction of the vice lords. And and one thing, too, I want to preface this for people listening. Um, gangs were originally created uh, to help protect and empower black communities, specifically young black men. It was not created as the narrative that the government later put out to terrorize neighborhoods and do these crimes and stuff like that. Gangs didn't start transitioning into a negative type of practice until like in the eighties, again, when crack cocaine was introduced into a lot of black communities and a lot of marginalized communities, but the original gangs uh, were created to help empower the black community. It was the same model that followed the Black Panthers. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of people don't understand that. So a lot of the laws, too, what we call nation laws, um, 
and the values that they would instill into the young men from the 80s to the 90s. I don't know what's happening today with the laws. I don't think a lot of these young men might be practicing some of the original um, teachings. You know, it's almost like the Nation of Islam. They would teach you and hand you information just to um, learn to be a better provider, be a better community leader. Those are laws that uh, was taught to a lot of young black men and gangs back in the day. Uh, and other things just came into the fold uh, that when drugs was introduced and a way to make money quicker, sooner, faster, um, it kind of eroded the community and, mm -hmm. and, and caused a lot of heartache and pain and broke down a lot of families and destroyed a lot of communities uh, from the crack epidemic that happened in the 80s. Uh, so everything started stemming from that. And then you can look today to <clears throat> there are still men and women serving federal time, uh, even for crimes related to marijuana. Yeah. Um, <laughs> where now marijuana is legal in a lot of states and they're still trying to push, even bipartisan push for it to make it a federal um, uh, mm. dismantle and federally where it's not considered a drug anymore but we people from even our own some of, a lot of activists in the world but in general our government fell these people these young men and women coming from marginalized communities that are serving time right now or have served time for marijuana when they have given a green light to venture capitalists to farmers, to um, um, 90, I think it's over 95% of the dispensaries that are in America are ran by um, uh, white men specifically. Um, and it's just a biased system where now that it's socially accepted, you forget about those you exploited and demonized for trying to make money for their family through this community and industry that eventually destroyed that family and removed that father figure, removed that young son from that family dynamic that could went on to been doing great things uh, if it was more socially accepted. So there's just a lot of yeah uh, heartache involved um, when you talk about that part of street life when it comes to drugs in the community because now it's becoming more socially accepted where before it wasn't. And a lot of people that was in those positions that was just trying to make money for their families were demonized and served time or still serving time and just set them back where they still are trying to uh, bounce back from them situations. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so you went to prison yeah. when, when you were 21, is that right? Yeah, I was indicted when I was 21, 21, 22, around that time. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. And, and what was prison life like? <laughs> yeah, it was. Every day felt like a Sunday, <laughs> uh, a Sunday afternoon. Every day felt like a Sunday afternoon, meaning slow. Mm. Um, you lose sense of time in there um, a lot of times. You got to stay busy. I stay busy. I read a lot of books. Uh, I didn't have money coming into my commissary. Um, you know, again, I come from a poor family and my mom couldn't afford to send me too much money, you know? Um, and so I had a little money on my books for just buying little groceries from apples to fruits and stuff like that, because I stopped eating meat my first week in prison. Um, so I would trade my meat protein with my cellmates for <clears throat> their carbs and they thought I was crazy and they thought I was weird for that. <laughs> now, and, let, before you go on, let me just, so the first week that you were in prison, yeah, you kind of had this, first week. this, first this week. epiphany, but, uh, like what was it that hit you that hard in the face that, okay, I'm not eating meat and I'm going to you know, give up my meat and take the, uh, my, my cellmates, uh, carbs. 
Yeah. So like I said at the beginning of the podcast, yeah, I was trying to figure out, you know, I, here I am serving time. First time I've been in prison. But I knew something was deeper than uh, this sentence that they gave me. And here I am just trying to figure out why was I removed from society? Why did I get a spank on my hand? Why did I get probation? And then I had to go to the law library to understand these biased laws that no matter what, I was going to have to serve time uh, coming from where I come from and on this very unfair judicial system that I had to deal with. But to me, again, it, I felt spiritually wise, there was something bigger going on. Mm -hmm. And that's when I got down on my knees my first week uh, to that's pray right. on it. Um, I'm not religious. I'm spiritual. I do believe in the universe and the higher energy. And I, I do believe there's just undefined power that none of us would truly comprehend or understand or has a monopoly on the truth. And I was just trying to search for that. And everything pointed to that childhood memory that I described when I was eight years old. Um, and it came into my thoughts right then and there, like a light bulb. And I was like, I get it. And that was right then and there, I did a hard reset and decided to denounce and not eat any meat. I made a promise to the universe. Mm -hmm. I would never eat meat again. Just get me home. I wanted to come home so bad. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not because I thought I was better than those guys in there. Uh, I just felt like I have never, and you're taught to suck it up as a, as a man. We, we wasn't taught about mental health. We wasn't taught about therapy, especially young black men. We was taught to suck it up and, and do what you need to do and get mm -hmm. through and power through. And I just felt like every day in that environment, uh, just was going to continue to chip at my mental health. Um, I already had claust I had claustrophobia as it was. Oh gosh. Yeah. Uh, from a trauma that I experienced as a kid, my cousins locked me up in a locker <laughs> when we went swimming. I was the, I was the smallest of my cousins and the lightest of my cousin. And they, and sometimes in the black community, they would pick on the lightest and the most fair skin. Um, and I had to prove my point to them that I was nothing to, joke around with. So I used to have to fight with them all the time to prove my worth. But I still compared to them. They was older and bigger than me. And they put me in a locker one time when I was uh, five years old and left me there for a long time where I just was screaming and kicking and have my knuckles was bleeding everywhere. And and the lifeguards found me uh, in the locker room. They had to cut off the lock and stuff. And I was collapsed because I couldn't even move. So I had that's how I developed claustrophobia from that experience. So here I am in prison. I didn't fear the, the, the men. I know how to handle myself really well when it comes to uh, dealing with other human beings physically if I needed to. But I feared this phobia and feared my mental health. And I just wanted to get home. And I had that conversation with the universe. I had a conversation with God. and and made a promise that I get it now. It, it's, you can't, you can't um, uh, lie to the universe, <laughs> if that makes sense. You can't lie. There's no one to be performative in front of. It was just me and that source and that energy in that moment that I was having this conversation for. There's no cameras, there's no social media. It's just me and this conversation. And I felt like the universe knew that I was truly convicted and truly believed in this new life. And to this day, I never looked back. And it gave me a peace of mind and I stopped eating meat. I denounced it and never looked back. And that was 22 years ago. And you say the claustrophobia, uh, how big was the cell? And did you feel claustrophobic in the cell? Yeah, the cell... Um, so my holding cell during a detention center, because you, you have, it's a process. You are at a detention center or um, a facility designated for people that are still going back and forth between trial or people are waiting to be shipped off to their actual, uh, to the penitentiary that they're going to serve. Uh, so it's, it's almost like a transitional facility, which is kind of worse because cells are smaller and it's, it's a lot more crowded and there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of other, 
Uh, it's an environment that can make your time worse because people are coming in and out. Uh, people are stressed. Fights are breaking out. It feels like a county mm. in a way, a county jail. If you ever experience a county jail, or know anyone that ever experienced a county jail. Uh, but yeah, I was on deck when I did that. And then a couple weeks later, I got shipped out to Minnesota to serve the first part of my time. My last part of my time was in Florence, Colorado. Um, but yeah, I got shipped out to Minnesota uh, to serve that time. And that, as you go through your time in the feds, your security levels come down to when you become what we call a short timer after a while. Um, but I was able to get over my phobia. Um, it did almost break me and challenge me, but what probably really did get me out of that experience of being claustrophobic was when I went to the hole. Um, I was in the hole for exactly 40 nights. Um, what is the, what is the hole? It's this shoe segregated housing unit. You're separated from, uh, the, uh, population of the, uh, the main population of the prison for fighting or whatever you in the hole for, um, to contraband to, you yeah. Know. Why did you get put in there? I got into a fight. Uh, this guy I was playing chess with, um, I was one of the best chess players in my prison. I've been playing chess since I've been five. That's another th fun fact that people don't know about. <laughs> nice. nice. I'm really good at chess. Really, really good. Um, and I probably, I don't know, won over 500 games in prison and lost probably a total of like 11. Yeah. You yeah. know, that's how good I was. Cause there's some incredible players in there too. Uh, but this one game I was playing with this guy right before count time, we would have what's called count. You have to five times out of the day, you have to be in your cell or at your workstation or wherever you're designated to be at. Uh, when the uh, COs uh, walk through the entire compound to count, make sure no one escaped. No matter where you're at in certain time in the feds, you can be in the hole, you can be top security, you can be low security. It's called count time. Everybody knows about count and everybody knows you do not fuck up count. You do not mm -hmm. mess around with count because if you mess up the count and someone's missing and they have to go recount the whole place. Mm. You are not only are the inmates are going to be pissed off at you. Can you stop in the flow of the one to go eat? You know, and there might be dinner time for at the counter. Or you stop in the whole scheduling of the prison system, but the COs are switching shifts and you causing them to be delayed to go home. And these guys not making money. You know, these are, low paying officers and stuff they're stressed and you know they're living in these small communities where these prisons are at these big industrial prisons are so you know it's, it's a different dynamic you're dealing with so you fuck up a count you're getting put in a hole and nobody wants to be put in a hole only thing that one thing i would say hollywood painted right about the hole or being put in the shoe is that's kind of accurate the way they did where you have these steel doors and no sunlight um getting to you in that cell it's a very small cell that's probably the size of a bathroom your most average bathroom that you will have yeah uh, and it's usually about two doors to three doors to get to you doesn't feel like no ventilation you you sleep piss shit every day there they don't give you any books to read you just get a yellow legal pad uh one um uh, just in a, a p piece of pencil, if you want to write some letters, if that, um, because they only give you like a stamp a week or I can't even remember. It's been so long ago, but you are in this box where you stuck there for 23 hours and they'll let you out for one hour into another hole that just has an open ceiling where you can see the sunlight. But you're only in there for one hour and then you go put back in a hole. And then on weekends, you don't get no sunlight. You stay in that, that hole the entire time on weekends. It's a very it's very inhumane. Uh, let's just say that. And you in there with it makes me it makes every it makes every part of my my body just kind of squirm and just freak out thinking about it. 
Yeah. So imagine like in me and your community, I, mean, I tell people this when I have my talks, uh, I would never and none of us would never experience what farm animals go through or animal agriculture. But to be in those conditions where it's inhumane and almost unbearable, it was the closest I can experience being consider property and not being able to do absolutely nothing about it. You're just helpless in that scenario because most of the guys too, you're not just in a hole by yourself. Sometimes they'll, it's such an overcrowded system. You're in there with like two to three other guys in this small hole and y'all are looking at each other and the most wildest shit going through your mind, you know, where some people are losing it in there with you. It could turn violent. Somebody want to fight. And there's so much, so much talking. You can talk to someone. It just feels unreal. And it feels, it's just insane. So I was in there for 40 nights uh, because this guy, again, playing chess, uh, I was trying to rush the move and he beat me. So he was excited and was paying, playing for what's, we was playing from, you had two options when you're playing chess in the system. Usually guys play for money, like commissary. If you beat me, I'll buy you some food on commissary or, um, or you'll play for push-ups. Um, yeah. I, I've never been a gambler. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just, it's just not in me. I'm, I have no, nothing in my DNA that likes to gamble as far yeah. as money, monetary things. So I play for push-ups. Uh, and we pay for 100 push-ups, one set of 100 push-ups. That's what we was doing, one set of 100 push-ups. Um, but I told him we had to wait to have to count because, if we, you know, we got to get to ourselves. It, it happened right. He beat me right two minutes before count. <laughs> it's like, all right, I got you out the count. So, no, I want it now. I was like, dude, we finna fuck up count. What the fuck is wrong with you? Like, we do this at the count. Like, it was in the rec room area, and we need to get back to ourselves. And he was like so excited about the fact he beat me. Yeah. Um, and he's like, no, I want it now. And in that moment, you forget that you're in prison. Like, you need to watch your back. I'm just like, and I said, motherfucker, I, I you know, I cussed him. I, went, I was like, went off on him, like, dude, I'll get you at the count. The fuck out of here. And I turn up just like that. I just said it casually. Forgot I'm in prison. Um, cause I've been serving time now. I've been, I'm deep in the system now. I've been, this is like halfway in my time now. Like, it's not like I'm a newbie and I turn my back and it's not like nobody, you don't think somebody gonna fuck with you. Like, you know, people know who I was and it's not something that you would just think you need to defend your life on as instantly like that. You know, you always gotta be alert. Trust me. You know, you sleep with your boots on, you be alert, mm. but I just, got too comfortable in that moment turned my back after i said something casual to him like dude i'm not fucking account get the fuck out of here in that way um probably said some more words and next thing you know blackout he took a chair so imagine a guy my size i'm a pretty big dude taking a chair with all his might hitting you from behind with a chair one of those metal chairs you fold up oh yeah it's a metal chair you know you fold up and swinging it like a baseball pack and hit the whole t- back of my head, knocked me unconscious. Um, and so I woke up. <laughs> doesn't sound like doesn't sound like you were fighting. It sounds like he just hit you. Yeah, I, I didn't get a I didn't get a lick in. Yeah, no, I, I didn't see it coming. Like I turned my back and everything was black from there. I woke up to I was going in and out of conscious. Um, and and it was that's a real experience and I, I bullshit you not. I don't think I really said this on some podcasts when me discussing this part of my story, but mm-hmm. in that moment <clears throat> I had like a life, um, a out of body experience where I was able to see myself, um, looking down at my body and I was in the arms of my cellmate, uh, Ty, he was holding me up. And then, then I went back into conscious, back back in, in and out of conscious, and then I looked back up, and I'm just everything was blurry, and, and Ty was holding me like you know, he was rocking me. He was like, "Hold on, no, hold on, I got you, I got you. Just stay with me, stay with me." And I was just like, "Cause he found me, you know. They was looking for me, you know, my cellmates." The, uh, yeah, the count. Yeah, the count going on. The count going on. My cellmate like, "Yo, fucking dumb it, like you know, cause he don't fuck at the count, like you know." They found me in the rec room, just lifeless you know like just on my face because i felt on my face and he flipped me over and like trying to get me back to conscious yelling for help um and i i came finally came to and then um uh, the co's rushed over and then they grabbed me up 
And then I just blacked out again. And that's then, you know, I, I wake up, I'm in a hospital with handcuffs to the bed mm -hmm. um, with twos on my nose and shit. And, and I'm just like, you know, I could feel like all this pain in the back of my head, like what's, what's going on? And, and I didn't know who I was. I had amnesia. Mm. It's like, do you know who you are? You know, I was like, no, I don't. What? What? I, it, I couldn't even form words. <laughs> like I couldn't. I was like, oh, I couldn't even understand what they was talking about, comprehending. <clears throat> and it was like, just rest, just rest. And they pushed me back down, and I just went back like to sleep, and then woke back up, looking at the ceiling, and um, trying to figure out what the fuck is going on. And I looked at the handcuffs again to the bed. And then I see two CEOs at the end in my room in the bed talking to the doctors. And then I closed my eyes and then I, sw I kid you not, it was like a computer drive being uploaded. And then I woke back up and I felt this warm sensation from the back of my neck going all the way up to the top of my head. And all these memories, thousands of thousands of memories just started shooting through my head. It felt like bass in my ear. My ears was ringing like do, 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 do. It, it was mm. the most craziest experience I've experienced to this day where these memories are being uploaded into my mind, my thoughts. And my, I started hyperventilating <laughs> and I just started shaking the bed violently like, yo, get me the f fuck out of here. Like, I, And up into that very last memory that got inserted when... I turn my back on a dude because now I'm violent now. Like I'm the most violent I have been in my life because the first thing on my mind is revenge. I want to kill him. Mm -hmm. Like literally kill. I have never to this day had that experience have ever in my, in my life where I wanted to literally kill this dude with my bare hands because he tried to kill me. Like I didn't know who I was. Like, you know, because it's like, yo, calm down. Like, I'm just shaking the bed. Like, I'm, I just wanted to, I was reacting from, it's like my brain came back to reality, but then put me back in that last scenario that somebody just tried to take my life. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I'm just on defense mode. There's like, inmate, do you know where you are? I was like, yes, I know where I am. There's like, where are you? I was like, I'm in Minnesota. Get me the fuck out. Like, get, get me out of here. Like, there's like, what's your inmate number? I gave him my inmate number, everything like that. I'm just shaking it. They're like, calm down. Like, yo, you need to calm down. Like, they holding me down. Like, I know. There's like, yo, what happened to you? I was like, yo, I'm just, I'm calm down. Like, just give me back. Give me back. Give me back. I want to be put back in general pop. You know, I want to go after this dude. You know, uh, there's like, we, we taking you back to the lieutenant. Um, so they took me back to the uh, the prison and the doctor was like, yo, he needs observation. Yo, he just suffered trauma, serious trauma. Like he lost his memory. And they was like, no, we're taking him back. They didn't give a fuck. They didn't give a fuck. I don't think you can get away with that shit today. I think there's, <laughs> it's not a, it's a, yeah, yeah, it's a different life now, you know, but back then they didn't give a fuck. They, they, so we went back to the prison and I'm steaming. I'm like pissed. My whole side of my face is swollen because I fell on my face. So my, my tooth went into my jaw my jaw kind of like ballooned up. Uh, my my forearm was kind of sprained because I fell on my forearm and my elbow. And so I was in a sling. And I got back to the prison and they sat me down with the lieutenant, uh, the head of the COs. And he was like, okay, so what happened, Thompson? What happened? I was like, I don't know. I was just playing chess with this guy, this stranger. There's like a guy. You don't know who this guy is? I was like, no. Nah, I don't ever, I've seen him like once or twice. I don't know who he is. So you don't know who you was playing chess with. You know, they they know who it was. They wanted me to make them out. Hmm. But I didn't want to make them out. I didn't want to tell on him. I want to get to him first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because in the federal system, you are not allowed to put hands. If you caught fighting with another inmate, it's an assault charge. You know, and extra time to you. It's almost like it's as worse if you're trying to fight a CEO. They do not play that. You are not to touch each other. Um, you will get more time added to you. But they wanted me to. So you didn't. It. So you didn't care that you were potentially looking at more time. You just wanted revenge on this guy. Uh, yep. huh? Not at all. Not at all. Really? I was ready to throw my whole life away at that moment. That's crazy. Because crazy. again, so did you meet I, the guy? I, what I think, happened? I, I think so. So keep in mind. Yeah. Uh, we all forget. Yeah, we're humans. Yeah. But humans are animals, and the most violent. I was violated. The most violated thing you can do to a human being 
happened to me in that scenario where I didn't have a chance to defend myself. I'm right now just walking away and you Mm -hmm. hit me from behind, knocked me unconscious and you steady kicking me while I'm unconscious. My roommates, my cellmates ended up telling me they found me. This dude was kicking the shit out of me while I was just unconscious. Like, you know, like, can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Where everything in your DNA, like you can be the most kindest, nicest person. There's some things you just can't forgive. And there's some things you just, as a human animal, will naturally respond to. We're not thinking, you're not thinking clearly about the consequences. And that's, I wasn't thinking. I was a young man. Yeah. Not thinking about, I'm getting ready to throw my life away trying to kill this guy that tried to kill me. I wanted to revenge. I wanted revenge so bad that it was just running through me. But I was also conscious enough to realize that if I told on this guy, I would never get revenge. And so did you ever encounter this guy uh, again? And what happened? Uh, so I didn't tell on him. Um, and they were smart about it. They was like, well, yeah. So since you're not going to tell us who did this, we got to keep you separated from General Pop till we finish up our investigation. So we're going to put you in the shoe. I was like, the shoe? And it's like, yeah, the hole. We got to protect. Yeah. You know, and I was like, fuck, here I am. They was like, we don't have to put you in a the hole. They're playing that good cop, bad cop shit. Yeah. You can go back in General Pop if you tell us who did this. And I was like, mm-mm, can't do that. Because yeah, I can't go back on General Pop where people be like, damn, he came back on General Pop. This happened to him. He must have ratted. Right. You know, like, too, you can't have that reputation, right? Uh, so I went through the hole. I went through the hole. But I went through the hole, and I think I was going to be in there for so long. I'm thinking, like, okay, I might be here a day or two. Whatever. Let me just sit this one out. And what ended up, when I thought it was going to be one night, the two nights ended up to 40 exact nights. They let me out. July 12th on my mother's birthday. I remember when they told me, I was like, what day? I, I lost sense of time. Mm-hmm. I, I lost sense of everything. Um, and they told me what day it was. I was like, today's my mother's birthday. I lost a lot of weight <clears throat> up in there, but they let me out. Um, were you able to, eat, were you able to eat vegan while you're in the house? Yeah, I was eating. Well, keep in mind. So when I stopped eating meat, I was vegetarian in prison. I wasn't vegan in prison. Yeah. I was vegetarian. So yeah, I was eating okay. the sides and stuff and shit that they, uh, Nasty shit. They were sliding through the doors uh, yeah. of the hole, but yeah, they let me out, um, and they told me that they shipped him. They said so. We we concluded our investigation and we shipped the guy to a different prison. Mm. Um, you, so he's not in general pop. We had to keep anytime there's a severe fight like that, we had to keep you guys separated. So, uh, so they ended up telling me that, and I was like, huh. I was like, okay. So that's when I went back to my cell and went back to my my time and my cellmates told me everything that happened that went down and, 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 and it was crazy. Uh, so yeah, I never to this day, uh, seen him again, uh, to this day. Uh, but what I did hear, um, that the prison that he ended up going to serve his time to, uh, those Chicago boys, um, he got into a, a, scu- a scuffle with them. Um, from what I understand, they found out what he did to one of their fellow Chicago boys, and they there were some consequences from what I understand. Yeah, um, something that I didn't green light, but hey, you know, it's called karma. Uh, so that's what happened in that time, but yeah, to this day, I, I never seen them again in my life. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. that, was, that was quite a quite a rabbit hole we went down yeah yeah it was a rabbit hole no no it no was an honest rabbit hole though too yeah yeah, so, yeah yeah thank I'm you human. yeah so so i want so you became eating eating like plant strong plant-based eat like an elephant yeah. you became one of the strongest people in the yeah. Yeah. in your prison community I did. I, and how did that feel? And how did they react? And were any of them like, man, I want to eat the way Dom eats? <laughs> yeah. You know, again, I had already a lot, a lot of people had a lot of respect for me considering what I just went through. Yeah. Um, and not, it takes a lot. Not many people would go the route that I went through, you know, uh, <clears throat> staying true to my core and, and 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 more coming out of the cell and 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 more so yeah they they called me crazy and weird for the things that they thought i was crazy like you would trade 
your chicken on your plate for you want my pasta and my carbs and all that because I ate a lot of complex and simple carbs. Uh, but they didn't mean it in a, de uh, a demonizing way. They just thought it was funny. Like, man, I can't believe that. You're crazy, dude. Like, you know, like in that way. Uh, but we will have what's called liftoffs. Uh, and this is a population of over a thousand inmates. Uh, and I will always come in the top 10 of these liftoffs. I was benching heavy, heavy iron, over 400 pounds, uh, squatting. And you were weighing, and you were weighing what, 200? I was weighing at that time about 195. Yeah, 200. I was some fluctuating between yeah. 200. The lowest I ever got in prison was 187. I was like 187 when I came out that hole. Very thin, my strong, because I was so dehydrated. Yeah. Um, I didn't have access to general resources that we had in prison from drinking water when I want to. The water that we would drink was coming out of the same uh, machine, uh, same. Um, design that we had to shit in mm, mm. um so naturally i wasn't really trying to drink too much water from that water fountain only when i was really really hydrated uh, uh dehydrated so um but yeah the lowest i've been was 187 but when i was pushing that weight i was about 195 to 200 flush yeah in and 400 that. pound bench press or more that's that's in, that's insane <laughs> yeah yeah and we didn't have supplements <laughs> nothing like that like you know it was just this is all natural just pushing heavy weights, squatting over 500, deadlifting over 500 like it was nothing. We'll wrap them boys up with the straps, you know, pull ups. And I, I can do sets of pull ups like for 50 reps. Like it was, like, like it was, it was crazy. That was the most insane being in shape I was in my life because I went from when I went in prison, keep in mind, I had a lot of inflammation and I was overweight. I had that living that drug drug dealer life at the time. And I was over 250 pounds uh, when I went into the system. And then when I stopped eating meat that first week, all that within a couple months, mm. it started shrinking all the inflammation going, the fat, everything like that. I was a husky dude and went down from a husky dude. to a solid dude. And it started working out and just became strong as fuck. Um, the science wasn't out there. We didn't have social media. We didn't have books. We didn't have forks or knives and stuff like that. We didn't have none of these things that can teach us what the food you eat does to your body. Um, I was like my own human experience. Mm -hmm. All I just know that I did it for ethical reasons. I love animals. I didn't want to have anything else to do with it. I didn't know what the hell was going to happen to me if I was going to wither away or die. All I know is just this is my decision to stop eating meat. And this is my conviction. And well, you must below, I just excelled in it. You must have loved the way you were feeling. I mean, that sounds yeah. like you're lean, mean, and you're strong as an ox. I, I tell people to this day, um, it's the first and only time that I felt like a real life, like I, like a real life superhero. Yeah. Meaning, like, you know, that superhero is like. Clark Kent, or a better way to put it, when they're like, you remember He Man or Thundercats, and they transform to these stronger human beings, these super people when they yeah. hit the sword up or whatever the case may be. But just to feel that transformation where I was seeing my abs and feeling so strong, like it was just, I felt supernaturally strong. It, it was incredible. It was such an incredible experience that I, I wish so many more people can experience to this day when they eat vegan and go completely plant based. One of the best experiences in my life for sure. Yeah. Are you still are you still friends with any any guys that are in prison? No, a lot a lot of those guys I forgot some of their names because we used to just go by last names in there. It's just a lot like the military. <laughs> we didn't go by first names. It'd be like Thompson, Thompson or yeah. Johnson or Taylor or uh some 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 of some of them we went through different street names i'm I'm only cool with one of them that uh, uh mike uh me and mike are still uh cool to this day he still lives in new york uh mike was what well, we he was in my car what we call our workout car uh, mm. and mike was the dude always pushing me uh and two other guys um, it was four of us. Every everybody that had a workout car had three to four guys in the car, and we call it a car because you guys are like in a car, you right. know. And there's a driver. This is what we're gonna do for the day. It's a whole system routine. 
everybody that's on that bench press for the day uh, or in a hope, you know, the weights was outside. This is old school bodybuilding, weightlifting setup where you got heavy iron plates that was up to 100 pounds a plate. They don't even make those too much anymore. Oof. You you still got these 45, but you have 100 pounds a plate here and there. You have some 45s, but everybody getting in, man, because it kept the stress down. It just kept you from thinking about the outside world. But you was in your car was your crew. You eat together. You work out together. And so Mike was the one, the only one that uh, we kept in touch with because he was he was a good dude. He was a solid dude. And uh, yeah, we kept in touch, especially when I lived in New York City, because that's where he was originally from, New York City. And he was able to find me um, through social media. He's like, "Yo, duh. <laughs> he found me through social media." <laughs> yeah. What about what about um, some of your old cousins? You said that were some of the original street people, like Booby. Yeah. All, uh, all my all all of my dead. Yeah, they dead. Uh, I have probably over ten people that I grew up with, from family mm. to friends that are all now dead um died at very very young ages uh, all murdered uh, most of them um movie mm -hmm. was executed from the back of his head playing uh, he was shot in the back of the head and, and so was uh walt dre playing dice and more and um but yeah um only two of them them survive mm -hmm. not passing away per se uh that's matt matt just came home actually a couple of years ago matt served time in his adult from the age of 15 he didn't get home he served about matt served about 20 years of hard time too not even state times they they had that boy in the hole for a while uh so he just came home in the last couple of years um after serving 20 years at the age of 15 and uh my other cousin derek is doing life um and mm. the rest everybody else is dead yeah mm. what what is your uh is your mom just proud as punch of where you are and what you've able been able to do with your life now yeah i i think she is um i mean i, I know she is um but yeah she we went through my entire family um uh, not just with me just mm -hmm. the fact that most of the men from my generation and up are deceased, you know, or, you know, or, or went through similar trajectory than I, I did. Um, but, and it, I did everything I could, which I'm proud of to have the younger generation under me. They didn't have to go through that. You know, I have been very, um, in good ways that, asshole of an uncle that just on you about things because i want you to do better and you, you have me as a mentor and have me to educate you about the do's and the don'ts to the the nice uncle the cool uncle um that's what the title that i probably wear that my nephews have not had to walk in the same shoes that i had to walk in because i had something to say about it do you uh are you i mean yeah do you feel any kind of responsibility to get out and try and talk to some of the, I don't know, schools, prisons, whatever about, you know, uh, your experience and it's kind of a, um, you know, a telltale that can help them out. It's not that I feel responsible yeah. uh, to do it, but I definitely do want to do that. I just have not to this day been introduced to a organization yeah or a group of people that are genuinely trying to invoke change a lot of these you and i both have worked with nonprofits before and there's a lot of them that are performative um, um but i have yet to be introduced to a group of people or a nonprofit that i feel good about doing that type of work to go into those systems and and speak at those prisons to tell these young men that there's a such thing as second chances mm -hmm. and in some scenarios third chances the outside world is moving very fast but there are people like you and i uh, that are making changes and you can definitely turn your life around like i did and i definitely want to be involved in it i just have yet to be introduced 
to mm-hmm. that network. It's only so far my own network goes through uh, that I'm connected to, uh, but more than willing to look, absolutely love that opportunity to get more involved in that for sure. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think I, I read in reviewing like a lot of your Instagram posts and stuff that, you know, you're saying like, I think it was like saving animals is so gangster. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, I, I would hope that that would resonate with, with people and they go, Oh, you know what? I've never looked at it that way. Um, yeah. and, and, um, you know, you're also incredibly entrepreneurial and, as you've said, creative. And you've got two different companies yeah, yeah. That, you, that you've started, yeah. the crazies and the weirdos and the yeah. uh, Eat What Elephants Eat, right? Yeah, the food company um, Eat What Elephants Eat is very special and dear to my heart because I was uh, uh, causing a lot of disruption Um whether it be through speaking engagements or forms of activism or even online uh, disruptions where people would come to me like say, hey, man, I want to be vegan and I want to go vegan. How do I start? Um, And I would, you know, refer them to different nonprofits or for profits or websites and companies that I knew of, but I didn't have a chance to vet them myself. I, I just felt like there were good men and women working at these companies. Uh, I didn't have the time or the bandwidth to really go down there. And then they would come back to me like, no, man, they don't understand me. They don't look like you and me. And, and, you know, they, they want me to do this and that. And, or they're not very empathetic to the fact that I have a limited budget. And I was just hearing a lot of negative feedback Mm -hmm. Uh, and I felt bad. And I was like, that makes sense. Uh, So that's when I created Eat Well and See. Uh, and our mission, our primary mission is to make plant-based eating not only accessible, but more importantly, affordable. Mm. Um, and for as little as uh, $14 a month or $100 a year, which is less than $10 a month, um, you can have access to this amazing meal planning program uh, where you have access to over 3,000 recipes um, and and great food coaches and RDs and people. You go through this onboarding process that... It's just incredible uh, through this amazing, amazing team that a few of us in the, the, the PB community share. Um, right. So that was important to me uh, to get that program off the ground. Um, and uh, and has signed, we have thousands of thousands of happy people that have converted over and ate plant-based because of this. And that's phase one. That's our nutritional wellness program, our meal plan program. And phase two, under Eat Well, Offense Eat, is our superfood lines. We're coming out with that uh, next summer. Um, and then phase three and four, uh, in the next couple of years, we're going to have a juice and smoothie bars uh, and a couple of restaurant concepts where we're going to do food uh, farm to table mm-hmm. um, and partner up with local um urban farms and, and, and teach new locals, a new farm skill set while I serve on this, uh, on the communities of color. Uh, it will be the biggest, um, customer where we take the, 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 the veganic farming directly to the counters and it'd be farm to table. So I'm really looking forward to the next things we're going to be doing in the next two to five years under <laughs> the eat what elephants eat brand. Got it. So that'll all be under that brand, which is the same, tentatively the same title as the book that'll be coming out yeah it's a great synergy yeah yeah Yeah. and then you also have sustainable clothing line uh what is it weirdos uh, yeah crazy crazies and weirdos (laughs) that was uh my first company that i started uh when i first uh uh got on the gram 10 years ago um i wanted to create um a uh, at that time, I had the largest vegan mail account and things was in chronological order. Engagement was 30 percent up. It was a different time of social media, but the it was a lot of initiatives happening and a lot of just problems and uh, happening with animals, specifically the elephants in Africa was going through a hell of a huge poaching crisis in the rhinos and they needed funding for drones and rangers. So I thought what cool way then to create a t-shirt to help raise some type of funding or percentage of sales can go to some of these nonprofits. So I created this shirt and 
I'm always telling people to eat plants and I'm always telling people that the largest elephants in the world are elephants. And that's how they, the trademark, the, the moniker of eat what elephants eat was formed. I designed eat the, the, the fonts and all of that, but I put the, the, the saying eat what elephants eat on our first t-shirt and we sold over 5,000 units. Nice. Like within the first quarter, I, I didn't think I had a type of impact. It was crazy. <laughs> Uh, I put it on my Jack Torso at the time, and and the shirt went viral, where it became the number one selling vegan shirt in the world, mm. uh, where we killed it. And I was like, oh, shit, this is incredible. So I was like, we need to do another one and uh, you know, continue to do this like every quarter. So I created Clark Kent was vegan yeah, uh, and designed that shirt. And that rival Eat What Elephants Eat shirt to the point that Molly Cyrus slid into our DMs like, yo, I'm a big fan of your clothes and your shirt. And I didn't have a social media manager at the time. Like, I'm still like trying to learn social media again. This is like eight, 10 years ago. Yeah. And she's like, my boyfriend, Leanne, is a big fan of um, this guy, Dominic Thompson. And I'm acting like I'm acting like, oh, OK, that's cool. Like, you know, <laughs> I'm typing behind the scenes to these messages when she was messaging me directly. Like I'm no like she was messaging crazies and weirdos, but I'm crazies and weirdos manager. Right. Social media manager. Because I never I would brand I would wear crazies and weirdos clothes as if I was a brand ambassador. I never had that ego to be like that's my brand right by my shirts i was just always like right like like you got me like this right now you would never know this comes from a company that i own or anything like that you know like i just never promoted myself in that way or exploited me 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 i think it just i always kind of knew in the back of my head people may adore me or hate me as a public figure but they may love something that I created for as a product as an entrepreneur or a restaurant or food. Um, and they'll support it, but they know I'm behind it and they hate me. They're not going to support it. You know? Mm -hmm. So I just kind of always separated myself mm -hmm. away from that. Let me just be a face of the brand brand ambassador of the brand. And here I was still trying to figure out social media and this a lister is in my DM and asking and fangirling over our clothes and Hey, can you yeah. send us a, a gift package? And I was like, Sure. Okay. She gave us her private Malibu address. Well, me, her about private. And here I am working full time in healthcare. <laughs> so I'm working. This is before I went on full time as an entrepreneur, uh, working forty hours a week in healthcare, um, and busting my ass, staying up to two or three o'clock in the morning, fulfilling these orders by myself. I didn't have any help. It was just me, um, in 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 my New York apartment. Um, and my ex at the time, she was a lawyer. She hated it. She thought this was beneath us and she would have an attitude about it. It's a whole different story. But here I was. It was a surreal moment that we was hitting every continent with these shirts. It was crazy. Shirts were going from New York to Canada to Austria to Japan to South Africa to everywhere. Italy was like, what the fuck? I can't believe I had this impact. Yeah. And, and this A-list is in my fucking DM. I was like, yo, I'm a big fan. I was like, all right, cool. Didn't think nothing of it. We shipped, I shipped it to her Malibu address two weeks later on a Saturday. I remember it was like it was yesterday. My phone lights up like a Christmas tree with these notifications. She posted it to her 30 million Instagram followers. Oh. That was at, she had 30 million at that time. She has like over hundreds and hundreds of millions now, but 30 million back then was insane to her Instagram followers with a blunt in her mouth. Clark Kent was vegan hoodie saying, Go vegan with middle fingers up. <laughs> <laughs> shut our website down <laughs> i couldn't even keep up with it. it was just crazy like we was already popping we was already doing good uh as a company uh because our customers was our brand ambassadors people would love yeah. back then people love tagging the shirts like it's different now social media is different now but then people was excited and it was happy about these shirts uh and then we have this a-lister that's when i knew i have arrived where I, I couldn't keep up with orders that I had to resign from my position in healthcare and never look back. And how, how many years ago was that? That was about six years, six, seven years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Nice. Yeah. Um, so do you, it seems to me and looking through your Instagram and, you know, I, I just want you to know, a, I love your taste in music. <laughs> I just <laughs> like, like I must have listened to that kicking it like 15 times since I, you know, heard it on, on one of your, 
one of your Instagram uh, posts. Yeah. Um, but it also seems to me like you got a nice balance between not taking yourself too seriously and knowing like how to focus. But like, you know, you got that sign in your kitchen, you know, that um, this kitchen is for dancing, right? Yeah. 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 And, you, and yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm a firm believer in I if you are a human being that takes yourself too seriously, I'm not going to take you too seriously. That's just who yeah. I am. I mean, I, I, I like to have, have fun and I definitely am serious on a lot of serious issues. Uh, but again, when it comes to this social media that we are involved in, in many capacities, a lot of us didn't think this was going to be around to this day, but mm -hmm. it has created careers. It has created opportunities. You and I wouldn't have met each other and be talking right now if it wasn't for social media where mm -hmm. It has definitely had a big impact on society. And I think it's a beautiful thing. You have pros and cons to social media, um, but it's changing now too. The, from the algorithms are not really uh, showing your content to your core audience, to um, di different challenges when it comes to a brand in itself or a creator in itself or an entrepreneur in itself, however you want to deem yourself specifically. Uh, and I have always, since day one of being on social media, I've been doing this now for about 10 years uh, when I first opened up my Instagram account. Um, hey, Dom, I, let me interrupt you. Do you know, can you remember what your first post was on Instagram? Yeah, I. it, it was a post in my New York apartment uh, well, I can tell you one of the first couple posts. I think it was I can tell you because I looked it up. <laughs> yeah, okay. which which one was it? I, I know the few of them. One was a picture of my nephew and my 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 fur daughter. Um, I can remember that because he he was visiting me in my New York apartment at the time. But probably the first couple was either me doing a curl, arm curl, or or her. Soka was all my fur daughter was all over my Instagram. But it was something around that. This that was time. your first post, and it's dated. Uh, August 15th, 2012 was you doing, it, it says you're doing, I think pull-ups with 300 and it says 340 yeah. pounds of pull-ups. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I had, yeah, I had, I had, um, you had a belt on with some I weight. had a belt on with about three or four plates of 45s and exactly. I had a combination of my weight. So yeah. it was over 300 pounds. Yep. Yep. I was doing a lot of weighted pull-ups pull back then. Yeah. Woo. Uh, <laughs> hey, uh, so you also have an Instagram post and you say it's Barry White waking up to pancakes on your mind. Yeah. And uh, this morning, what did you wake up with on your mind? What as far you as food or? Oh, yeah, as, far, as far as food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, I was going to say, I woke up with, again, <laughs> I went to the gym. Let me get this get this in. I made me, um, I know I was joking earlier when we were doing the testing about oatmeal. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't have oatmeal though. I had a really good fat smoothie uh, made with maca powder, uh, bananas, dates, strawberry, peanut butter powder, because that's less fattening. Yeah. Uh, some hemp seeds, maple syrup, uh, about a scoop of um, plant based protein with that, uh, with some mineral water. I usually like to make my smoothies with mineral water instead of plant based milk. So, yeah, I had one of those. It was really good. So you, yeah. So in going through your post too, I have also noticed, and you said this, that, you know, growing up you, you cooked, right? Yeah. Uh, I cooked a lot. Yeah. I'm a really good, I cook every day, but every day. And, 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 and I, in going through your posts, I'm like, Oh my God, this guy is like the real deal. Like he, <laughs> he walks the walk when it comes to cooking. Like you just said, you put in, did you say mineral water? Yeah, mineral water. Min yeah. Mineral water because yeah. it creates cer a certain something. I saw you make this dish. It's your favorite dish for four or more people where you take cauliflower and you yeah. do something insane with it. Yeah, I mean, so, so I, I, I have a really incredible, I have, most people um, are really hard critics on their cooking, yeah. like most chefs are. Like I, I'm one of those too. Like somebody be like, Oh my God, this is amazing. I'm like, it's okay. You know, cause you know, you, <laughs> it's your own cooking. You're going to criticize your own cooking. Right. You know what I mean? It might be amazing to somebody else, but there are some dishes where I'm like, mm, I hit that one. <laughs> and that's my Buffalo cauliflower. I make it gluten-free. I don't fry it. I yeah. bake it. I use a combination of chickpea powder, uh, sorry, chickpea powder uh, with uh, almond flour and cornmeal and mix it in with par paprika and some other spices. Um, uh, 
uh, that's unique to that. Use a egg replacer uh, from Bob Mills and uh, mix that in with a little bit of maple syrup. Um, coat those cauliflowers. Oh yeah. Uh, up and, oh. and bake it, and um, and make my own hot sauce. So it and it's 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 healthy. All of it's healthy. It's nothing. Uh, fattening about it or processing about it. It's gluten free. So you try and do um, low fat. I try to do gluten free, completely gluten free, and pretty much low fat as much as possible. So you, like a, this is what I was t- telling you about the smoothie. Instead of like yeah. spoons of oil, peanut yeah. butter, I yeah. use peanut butter powder. So do you? So do you? Uh, uh, do you cook with much oil or or not? Like uh, uh, well, well far. Yeah, so as far as cooking, um, like if I want to saute tempeh, I do use oil. I do use mm-hmm. olive oil, seed oils, and stuff like that because there's nothing wrong with oils. But as far as like processed foods or oils that is more uh, full of preservatives and more, I stay away from those as much as I can. Now, granted, I'm not going to lie to you. I do love me a good junk food vegan meal. <laughs> Every now and then, I do love sure. me a good vegan burger like all of us do. I'm a guy's guy. I love to have a big-ass sandwich with you know some – nice cut pan fries, you know, but I don't do that every day. That's like a once every two yeah. weeks thing. If I, that. you made, I saw a whole plant-based mango Alfredo sauce that you oh, made. Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, what yeah. a mango, yeah. mango is the base. Get, get, get out yeah. of town. Yeah, man. Like it's, it's so many crazy recipes that I can't wait to share through my book, but also, I'm looking forward to sharing more with the world, man. I would love to highlight uh, one of my goals um, right before the pandemic. I was in talks with some production companies. They've been begging me to do these stupid dating shows. And I'm like, I'm not doing a dating show. Yeah. Um, and I get it because my online personality shows every part of me. I wear my heart on my sleeve. I'm very transparent. I'm not, you can't put me in a niche, right? I'm, I'm, I'm considered just, a pretty versatile dude. So I like to show a lot of my whole entire lifestyle, who I am. But since I am single, um, they try to five years in a row, put me on the bachelor and all these other days. So they even went to some of the people in our community that are uh, into the production companies <laughs> to say, Hey, can you get Dom Thompson to do this? And they reached out to me. I was like, no, I'm not doing these dating shows, but this is what I will do. I will do, especially after I did um, duck dynasty. I taught the duck dynasty family, um, uh, keeping up with the robertsons how to cook plant-based i was on their first episode so i'm okay with doing shows like that but ultimately i do want to highlight the fact that you can be a guy's guy uh and break these stereotypes and eat plant-based and still be big strong and healthy um and cool and and not take yourself too seriously so my goal one of my goals is definitely have one of those amazing cook shows on one yeah. of the streaming platforms and we yeah. were in talks about it in the pandemic hit so hopefully we can get get that show back oh well, it'll all it'll all happen you just you just keep it real and stay authentic and it'll all happen yeah uh, so you you're you're pretty um you're pretty happy i mean you're you're happy you're a happy man you're a single man you love your dogs. Uh, so you're single by choice. And, yeah. you know, you've mentioned how, you know, people pressure you like, hey, you know, why don't you start dating or whatever? And you're like, you know, I'm good. I'm good. And yeah, I can tell you, and you, you, you talk about this, but there's so many people that are in miserable relationships, right? Yeah, and you, and I, and I watch you and you're just kind of marching through your life and you're happy and you got your sidekick, you know, pretty boy rock. Um, <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you how sorry I am to hear about, you know, um, Ruff, yeah. Ruff yeah. McFly. Yeah. yeah. Um, but That's my baby. Yeah. Yeah. And if I'd love for you to talk about her and, and rock, but, um, you know, uh, do you love being single and just the freedom you have? I do. It's amazing where, you know, I, the last relationship I was in, I was in a relationship for, we was together for five years. And again, that's with my ex when we lived in New York. Yeah. The, uh, amazing woman. I had nothing bad to say about it. Incredible woman. We just outgrew each other in many capacities. Um, and I made myself a promise that one, obviously and i left her she you know i left that I, when i left new york i left her i left corporate america i just did a heart another hard reset you we as human beings mm-hmm. can either accept evolution and evolve with it or we can remain stagnant and miserable and i'm 
built and engineered to want to keep growing and progressing. Uh, and here I had these opportunities of a lifetime that I needed to see through. And some people want you to be traditional and stay in that traditional role. And I get it. Here I am, an ex-felon making six figures in corporate America as a healthcare executive. She wanted me to stay in that role. Um, but here's these other opportunities where something's going to hit the fan. And that's why I had to leave corporate to focus on the entrepreneurial side of things uh, to see where this role would take me. Because again, it wasn't like I told you at the beginning of this podcast, it wasn't strategically planned. This all happened organically. And I believe to the core of my body that this is the universe doing this magic. And I just have to continue to follow those instructions because I already, last time I didn't listen to the universe, I, my ass ended up in prison. <laughs> so I'm just going off of what the universe is showing me and I'm going through that path. Uh, now, when it comes to uh, dating, like I said, I've been single, uh, self part, I call it self partnered by choice because so many years I have always put others in front of me and loved ones in front of me. And, but now is the time for me to knock out these milestones, to break these generational curses and to help set up this family tree that I belong to where generations can come and say like mm. our relative Dominic Thompson did some amazing things and he left behind some amazing resources for us to have a head start in life. So that's what I'm mainly focused on specifically me and my fur kid and my businesses. Now, if something comes organically out of that for me dating fine, but right now that's not my primary goal. That's not a priority to me. I enjoy being self partner and dating who I want to date you know, um, and, and having those experiences, but not relying on a timeline or a construct that society said, you need to have kids by now. You need to have a family by now. Yeah. Um, if it happens, that's a beautiful thing organically. But right now, this is my choice to not jump into something exclusively seriously uh, because I have goals and milestones and I like being single without the responsibility because it takes a lot to be involved in the marriage. And I respect people that are married and happy just as I respect for the fellow other people that are single and happy and I enjoy being single and happy. Yeah. You know what you, uh, you describe all that very eloquently. Thank you. Yeah. What about, what about uh pretty boy rock and, <laughs> and before, um, before rock, uh, scruff McFly. Uh, yeah. did, did you have dogs before these guys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I did. I, yeah, I, I, um, <laughs> Growing up in Chicago and in the in, in a black family and in, in the black community, I always used to, I always joke with people about it. Keep it. I, I feel like in my fifties I'm gonna do stand up comedy because I got a lot of <laughs> funny stories to tell. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, but it wasn't uncommon for families growing up in the hood or or poverty or more to take on a stray animal. Like stray animals were always showing up and. I don't know who started this uh, coin of adopt, not shop or adopting animals, but we kind of in a black community have been adopting and rescuing animals from since the fifties, to be honest with you. Like it's, it's nothing been nothing new. Like, that's just what we do. Like, okay, we, whatever we got left on the scraps, that stray cat, here you go, little one, Fido, or, you know, mm -hmm. some neighborhood dog bouncing around house to house. You can feed them or, and they become, or they'll start coming in the house. And before you know it, they're a family dog. So I grew up, we, we had a lot of different dogs in those capacities that came from the streets. Um, and I raised actually two, a couple of uh, German shepherds that all rescues pretty much. Um, again, we commercialized the word rescue and adopt, not shot so much. Um, but I was already doing, we was doing it from, from the beginning. Now with rock, I adopted him two years ago. Um, he, uh, came from a, a very unpleasant background where I had to go negotiate his surrender from, um, um some family in Chicago. Um, and so I had no desire to take on a big dog or another dog because Soka, my fur daughter, she was a senior dog and she was a Shih Tzu, Mr. Pomeranian. So she's a smaller dog and I've been accustomed to small dog life and I'm a busy guy and she would travel with me. And, mm. but you know, the heart knows that sometimes you have to step in a scenario. When I learned of this scenario and the way this guy was being treated, I had to, had to intervene as much as I could. And I ended up intervening, um, and yeah, he's been with me now for like two and a half years. Um, and, um, and Carrie, if you're there, if you could, 
maybe go to to Dom's Instagram page and pull up a photo so we can we can show it. Uh, also, uh, also McFly. Okay. Go, yeah, so you, go you go ahead. directly to both of their Instagrams without me being on the photos. Like if you go to Scruff McFly, that's her Instagram, and Pretty Boy Rock is his Instagram. Got it. Uh, but yeah, having uh, Rock come into my life, um, and like, and like, and Rock came into your life. Uh, while McFly was still alive, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, he did, he did, and he was very aggressive, very aggressive. Like he had no respect for no, no dogs, whether he's a senior citizen or a puppy. Like he <laughs> was ready to eat them on sight. Like Rock was real <laughs> aggressive. Like he was, uh, like acting like a wolf. <laughs> uh, but I, I have a. Fortunate for me, I, I think he was a really great mix and a fit for me, and I was a fit for him because his dad, me, have a lot of experience with animal advocacy and volunteering at farms and from domestic animals to wildlife to you name it. My entire resume has a pretty incredible background involving animal care and welfare. Um, so not to mention directly under my care. I don't have big dogs from the former German shepherds I used to have and uh, to little dogs and, and me being a former Ironman triathlete. Um, as you know, <laughs> as you know, Huskies are the ultra endurance athletes of the breeds. They can, your domestic Huskies, they can run up to 20 to 30 miles a day for 10 days straight without recovery. Uh, the most seasoned Huskies the ones that are pulling the sleds, which is inhumane in my in my opinion, and uh, we actually going to be working with PETA to do some uh, public service announcements about that. But those sled dogs, they do 100 miles a day for 10 days straight. So it's in their DNA. And, and Rock, he's a natural alpha. He, he loves to lead the pack. He loves to run. He, he's a natural runner. And so luckily for him, he paired up with the perfect parent. And we found each other. This, the universe introduced him to my life because it's almost as if the universe did in fact know uh, Scruff was going to be transitioning when she left us, and yeah, she transitioned. Uh, How did you care? Yeah, um, and I know that it broke your heart, and your heart is still broken from it. Yeah, I think about it every day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How did you? How did you? Um, how did uh, Scruff find you? Uh, my mom actually. Um, uh, used to go to once every year or two. Uh, her husband is from St. Thomas Island, and they would go visit his family in St. Thomas Island at least once a year. And so, as you know, when you visit islands, there's a lot of stray dogs and cats or family dogs that have – those dogs are just not fixed. They're, they don't practice the same type of policies that we do in America, at least back in those days. I don't know how it looks now. But – uh, she had found, uh, discovered Scruff um, being part of this litter of a friend of his, um, and it wasn't planned. <laughs> yeah. um, and so she fell in love with her. She was just this little, little cute little teddy bear, a puppy. And and my mom fought like hell to get her through customs and paid all these fines and penalties and brought her back to the states. And this is when I came wow. home. Um, I was on house arrest and. Uh, but Scruff, as a puppy, was getting picked on by uh, my mom's husband's dogs, uh, three chihuahuas. They was not – chihuahuas are – they built different, man. They just <laughs> they, – they're, they're, they can be evil. And they was – was, uh, if you ever seen the movie Gremlins, imagine Gremlins picking <laughs> on Gizmo. And oh, they was picking on little Gizmo, and she couldn't defend herself. And my mom was putting her in the bed with her and fighting with her, her husband about it. He's like, well – if she can't be down there with her brothers and sisters and she's always going to be in the bed with us, they all need to be in the bed with us. Cause those are his dogs, the chihuahuas. And my mom was like, they, I'm not putting those damn, she called them rats. I'm not putting those evil ass rats in my, my bed with me, with my baby. Like, you know, they would fight about it, like playfully fighting, but not playfully fighting. My mom was like having issues about it. And she told me about it. I was like, yo, look, I'm on house arrest. I'm in this. Granted, I was living in, I had my first apartment. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> Uh, after I got out the halfway house and it was um, it was in the hood, but it was my apartment. It was a big apartment, three bedrooms uh, in the hood of uh, the west side of Chicago. But I had all this time on my hands because we didn't have social media back then. 
only thing we have as something as a form of entertainment uh, was blockbuster video. That's all. Uh, yeah. You know, I couldn't even go to the gym on house arrest. I was only allowed to go to work. I had a curfew and they would they would check my vocal cords. They would call me all types of the hours. I'd have a house phone. It's like some recorded. They recorded my vocals at the probation office. So if it didn't match the computer, they would send the marshals to come get me. So I had to be on point. Um, so I was like, look, I got all this time on my hand. Um, bring her to me like I can raise her to she's a dog like give me like six months with her i got nothing but time on my i had no idea what type of dog she was talking about either she was just like okay fine she brought over on a saturday morning i was like open the door she knocked on the door and i was like where's she at and she pointed and uh looked down between her legs it's almost like a pixar movie these big brown eyes that open up (laughs) and look look right at you the biggest prettiest brown eyes uh and i lifted her up and uh and that's the first time my mama, my mom, <clears throat> seen me smile since me coming home from prison, and my mom started crying because she thought prison took my soul. I haven't, I had not cracked a smile since coming home from prison, and uh, we was inseparable ever since then. We spent a good f- close to fifteen years together. She died two weeks shy of becoming fifteen due to mm. uh, uh, kidney disease that had progressed really aggressively to the point that I couldn't reverse it, and she died in my arms. I. Uh, passed away naturally yeah did uh and you have a tattoo of her on your uh arm right yeah i got the tattoo done about four or five years ago of her before she passed away because she yeah always meant a lot to me she she'd been at triathlons with me she always been my good luck charm i was always kiss her on the forehead and now anytime i do like a heavy lift or go for a heavy run uh, and when i start back competing in the future like i always would kiss kiss my bicep as a reminder of my baby girl watching over me in heaven so yeah. and is is rock jealous of that tattoo or is you got a, <laughs> you got, you got a tattoo of rock coming down the I, I do got a tattoo of rock coming down the line for sure yeah yeah yeah, yeah. those are my two kids they both are one of one i've been around a lot of animals and a lot of them have similar personalities but like my mother said i know how to pick them meaning yeah. him rock and soka are just uh they're just one of one i have not met any dogs with the same personalities like they do. Got it. Got it. Hey, we got, we got to start winding this thing. Yeah. But, yeah. but um, tell me what do you have a favorite piece of fruit. If you had to pick one fruit for the rest of your life, what would it be? Uh, this has not changed. Um, um, but I'm still a big fan of watermelon. Uh, um, to me, uh, it's an underrated fruit. Keeps you hydrated. It has tons of protein in it. Um, that people don't realize those seeds has a lot of protein in it specific. I love juicing it. Uh, it's like a shot of supplements going through your bloodstream, uh, keeps you hydrated, gives you energy bouncing off the wall. Great for endurance training um, and more. So far as favorite fruit, definitely watermelon, watermelon I, followed by mangoes. Yeah. Yeah. I love watermelon, but I'm picky and the watermelon's got to taste just right. Otherwise I'm like, Oh, this is a bad watermelon. Yeah, so that's the beautiful thing about me living in Georgia. We produce some of the most amazing homegrown um, Georgia watermelons from some incredible farmers out here that Ooh. locally do it. We had the perfect climate to to produce it. So yeah, yeah, you got to taste a good Georgia yeah. watermelon. What about a veggie? Is there a is, do you have a favorite vegetable? Whether it's a, yeah, what, I, what is it? You know, I what's what's on both of our shirts kale ah. <laughs> I, I love me I, to me it's just you can create it and reproduce it in different ways from yeah making some amazing pasta to some amazing smoothies to juicing it it's just such a incredible amazing veggie uh, I, I just love all leafy greens um and i'm so glad that i found leafy greens and plant-based eating in general because i grew up uh in a community uh, uh, a food desert where we didn't have those options and stuff like that. So I, I, a lot of the fruits and vegetables I eat as an adult, never heard of it as a kid, never was introduced to it as a kid. So it's mm. pretty cool to, it's kind of like a new experience. It has been a new experience for me as an adult and I, lo- I love it. Mm. You know, it's interesting. You, you just, you just triggered a memory. I was on the Dr. Oz show, I don't know, a couple of years ago. And he, he asked me to take three Chicago firefighters, Mm-hmm. And to try and reverse some of their health conditions, high blood pressure, you know, o- overweight, um, cholesterol meds, all that stuff. And um, 
and he gave me two months to do it. Mm -hmm. And so I went into their households and I discovered that two of them were black. One of them was white, but I discovered that like these guys, I mean, they had never had a, some of them had never had a mango. They never had a bell pepper. They, I mean, it's, 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 it's crazy how, when you realize how many people haven't been exposed to, you know, the, the smorgasbord of different options that are out there when it comes yeah. to plant-based. Yeah. 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 Especially again, I, I think it's also a generational thing too. Uh, yeah. Um, but now it's so many different markets and so many different ways to be introduced to so many different fruits mm -hmm. and vegetables. And it's a beautiful thing now if you had the resources, uh, cause the accessibility is there in a lot of capacities. Sometimes yeah. you just got to do the extra work to find it for sure. Hey, uh, Dom, your middle name is, or your middle initial is Z. What does the Z stand for? It's actually not. Uh, everybody think, and I, I blame Rich for that. Rich Rose. Oh, oh really? Shout out, shout out to Rich, man. Still good guy. Uh, we yeah, both yeah. Rich. Uh, yeah. But when Rich first introduced me to his audience and and that that podcast that was uh, at the time one of his most downloaded podcasts, he said Dom Z. And I told him, there's no Z, Rich. It's just Dom's. The uh, Z is on the end of the M. So there's no Z in, in, in the middle initial. I have no Z in my middle name. <laughs> uh, but when he said Dom Z, a lot of people to this day, because when I when I uh, created my account, Instagram account, Dominic Thompson was taken. Uh, oh. So I was just like, okay, let me just use my nickname, Dom. Some people call me Dom or Dom. So that's where the Z come from, Dom's. Uh, and I just made Dom's Thompson. So, yeah, Rich, Rich is to blame for that. Got guy. it. Got it. Yeah, people uh, think it's uh, there. <laughs> so, any any um, any last words before we uh, we check out here, and and also let's be sure to let people know. And I know we've been laying it out here for people that aren't watching on YouTube. Where can they find you, and can you share all your Instagram and yeah. social media handles and all that? Yeah, the beautiful. So all my socials are the same. Um, it's it's just D O M Z T H O M P S O N Dom's Thompson. I'm on Instagram as Dom's Thompson. I'm on TikTok as Dom's Thompson. I'm on Facebook as uh, Dom's Thompson. You can turn uh, search through that. Uh, Twitter as well as Dom's Thompson. It's all uh, uniformed in that and my company um, that if any of you guys are interested in meal planning or, or just yeah. want to find out more information about eating plant-based, just go to eatwhatelephantseat.com um, and you can get started there. And other than that, um, those yep. are the best two ways to uh, get in contact with me. What if what if what if people want to eat what elephants eat T-shirt? Where do you go for that? Yeah, so it's hard to keep those shirts <laughs> in stock. <laughs> uh, we have been receiving complaints for a while. The fact that we haven't restocked them yet, but we're uh, going to relaunch with a huge uh, inventory of um, and also do some pre-ordering uh, this coming uh, first quarter of next year. So if you guys want. Eat what elephants eat. Go to uh, craziesandweirdos.com or be on the eatwhatelephantseat.com uh, website too as well. So in the first quarter. Next Got year. it. All right. I'm going to let you close this out. What do you want to say to the audience? Um, just continue to, you know, live your life as peaceful as you can without harming others. But more importantly, be appreciative of the little things um, because me waking up with a roof over my head and being able to put food on my table is something that I think we all take grant, granted for it because not many people have a roof over their head today mm -hmm. or woke up today. And to me, it's simple things like that that are special. And I hope you guys remember that that's special to you too as well. Awesome. Hey, Dom. <clears throat> Uh, will you give me a, a fist bump? Yes, my, my, got you. my kale brother. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dom Z Thompson is his social handle on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and all of the other social platforms that he has. You can also check out his site, eatwhatelephantseat.com. And of course, crazysandweirdos.com. Now, remember, we would love to have you join Dom, myself, and about 150 others for the Half Marathon, Marathon, and 5K as part of Team Plan Strong on February 19th, 2023. 
Simply go to planstrongfoods.com slash team and learn everything you need to know to take part. Keep it plan strong. Thank you for listening to the Plan Strong Podcast. You can support the show by taking a quick minute to follow us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Leaving us a positive review and sharing the show with your network is another great way to help us reach as many people as possible with the exciting news about plants. Thank you in advance for your support. It means everything. The Plant Strong Podcast team includes Carrie Barrett, Lori Kordowich, Amy Mackey, Patrick Gavin, and Wade Clark. This season is dedicated to all of those courageous truth seekers who weren't afraid to look through the lens with clear vision and hold firm to a higher truth. Most notably, my parents, Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn Jr. and Anne Cryle Esselstyn. Thanks for listening.